<laughs> hey, let's start our next unit, unit seven circuits. Here's what we're gonna learn. Really, Mitchell, you've been in my room all year? There you go. We're gonna define current. We're gonna solve problems involving current, time, and charge. We're gonna relate conventional current to the direction of electron flow. Well, we're gonna learn all this. Lots of stuff. Let's just jump on in. Lesson one, basic circuit concepts. We wanna talk about voltage, current, and resistance, V, I, and R. Voltage says, fill in the following key facts about voltage. What was its definition? Well, its definition was how much potential energy per coulomb. It was how much energy per charge you had at any one location. And the units, well, it was a joule per coulomb, which was defined as a volt. Oh, what was the other word for voltage, the one that I didn't like? Potential. Unfortunately, there's another word for voltage, and it's even worse than potential. Again, it's archaic. It comes from when we really didn't understand what voltage was. It's the new word that we'll often use in this unit. Or electromotive force. Except it's not a force. This one's even worse because it has a physics word in it. It's a force. If it was a force, what should it be measured in? Newton's is not. Although, thankfully, they'll often abbreviate this as EMF. I hate both of those terms. It's not a force. I, at one point, they thought that voltage was what was pushing things, uh, charges through a current. Well, it is, but it's not acting as a force. It's, 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 it's well, different. In fact, what's happening inside a voltage source? Inside a voltage source, you have lots of negative charges on one end. And what you have is some kind of chemical reaction doing work in separating the charges. There's some kind of chemical reaction that depends on the type of battery. And Joel, what it's doing is it's pulling apart positives and negatives and they want to go back towards each other. We pull them apart, the battery does that work, which means now they each have some energy. Oh, and then instead of letting them go back inside the battery, we force the electrons to go through a circuit through some wires to get back to the positives. The circuit symbol for a voltage source is that where that's the positive side and that's the negative side. Technically, we would call that a cell. Technically, a battery is several cells put together. You'll hear me often, though, call this a battery. Technically, though, a battery would be several cells put together. Okay, that's technically a battery. Eh, we won't be that fussy. What we're going to do to solve circuits, the first year, that, the first three years that I taught Physics 12, I taught circuitry purely algebraically because Arvinder, that's how I was taught. What we ended up doing is we got a system of equations for every single circuit, two equations with two variables, remember math 11, and then we solved them by getting, usually the substitution method, getting one of the variables. By, and it worked great. It made my little math part sing. And then about three years into my physics teaching, uh, Don Matthewson and Brent Kreitch, two excellent physics teachers, introduced me to a far better, much more intuitive way to do this. 
So we're going to solve a lot of these almost intuitively because we're going to come up with an analogy. The analogy we're going to use here is we're going to treat every single circuit as a ski hill. We're going to use our imagination, Katie, and we're going to pretend it's a ski hill. Recall that in the previous chapter we said that the gravitational analogy of voltage is height. So if I give you a circuit, you can sort of imagine that the cell, the voltage source, the battery, is the chairlift. What it's doing is it's lifting skiers, uh, electron skiers, to a higher height. And then the skiers ski down the mountain because they now have potential energy. Here's the ski hill that they ski down, and now they're back to the bottom. In fact, we would say something like this. Don't write this down. If that's an 8-volt battery, right here we have 8 volts of charge. Charge is the wrong word. We have eight, Right here, the potential is 8 volts. We haven't gone down any ski hills yet, Brianna, so we're still at 8 volts. There's only one ski hill. Right here, you would measure 8 volts. Right here, you would measure 0 volts because you've gone down the ski hill and you're back on the ground. What's the voltage right there? Zero volts. What's the voltage right there? Zero volts. What does the chairlift do? Connor, the chemical reaction in here, lifts them back up to eight volts again, so now they can go through the ski hill again. That's going to be our analogy, and it's not going to get much more complicated than that. So the voltage is at a point in the circuit is like the height at a certain point in the mountain. The voltage gain in the cell is like the height a skier gains on the chairlift. The voltage drop when you go through a resistor, that's like going down the ski hill so you end up back at the ground. Does that make sense? So ready, Connor? We're going to solve our first circuit. Don't write this down. That's the symbol for resistor. If this is a 9 volt battery and you take a voltmeter and you measure that the voltage drop right here is 6 volts, what must the voltage drop through here be if you're starting out at 9 volts and you want to end up back at ground level? Got to be 3 volts. It has to be. It has to be. Okay. Oh. Let's get complicated. Let's do a parallel circuit. Let's suppose that they could also... Oops, same color, Mr. Duke. Let's suppose they could also have gone this way. How many volts high did they start at, Kayla? How many did they lose going through this hill? Three. How many volts high are they right here still? Three. Still three. Okay. Still three. How many volts high are they right? Well, if they can go through this hill and also end up at ground level, you know how high this hill has to be? It's also got to be 3 volts. This is a fork in the ski hill. You can go down this hill and you'll lose 3 volts. You can go down this hill and you'll lose 3 volts. But since we leave and meet here, if we all meet up together, we better have gone through the same voltage drop, the same height. We're going to get more complicated and we're going to build these rules up. But this is going to be our analogy. Current. What happens if we connect a wire? Yeah, turn the page. Preferably without tearing up my stuff. You okay there, Nicole? You sure? Okay. Looks like you're taking out frustrations on some assignments or something. You good? Okay. What happens if we connect a wire to one side of a voltage source? Well, Negatives with the chemical reaction, they would get pushed this way, but they have nowhere to go. Very rapidly, they would just clump up. Uh, you can imagine it's a ski run that's closed. You'll have a few people come off the chairlift, but very quickly, we'll get back down the hill. Don't use this chairlift. That's a bad analogy because electrons don't think, Connor, but that's okay. It, it, it works. You'd get... A few electrons would build up. But then nothing.
What if the wire forms a continuous loop? Okay, now we get continuous flow. The electrons can flow from positive to negative. Sorry, from negative to positive. I said from positive to negative. From negative to positive. We get a continuous flow. This is a bad circuit, though. So part C says, what's the problem with the circuit in part B? If I go to our ski hill analogy, Connor, we have people being lifted up to 9 volts, but there's no ski hill, yet they do have to get down to the bottom. This is a cliff. This is a cliff. This is actually called a short circuit. What's going to happen? Remember, Kara, we defined voltage as energy per coulomb. When the charges leave this section of the battery, they have energy. It's got to go somewhere. Here, the energy would go in lighting the light bulb. Let's say it's a light bulb. Or powering your iPod. Let's say the, the energy would go somewhere. Is there anywhere for the energy to go in this circuit here? That it's got to go into the wires. Wires will get red hot fire. In fact, all of your stove elements, if you have an electric stove, are a controlled short circuit. They have a heavy resistance, generates lots of heat. Controlled short circuit. So why is this a better circuit? The bulb offers resistance, therefore energy has somewhere to go. And I got to be honest, most of what I'm going to be teaching you is garbage if you go on into electronics because although the bulb does offer some resistance, some of the energy mat will still go into heating up the wires. Okay, we're going to be in our magic physics world. We're going to pretend our wires have no resistance. We're going to have everything work out nice. Or if you're really designing circuits, you've got to take some of that into, a, into account. Although, get good wires and the resistance is near zero enough that it's fairly minor unless you're sending an awful lot of power through. But if you're wiring a washing machine or a dryer with a lot of power, then you'd have to be careful. Current. Current is defined as the rate of flow of charge in a circuit. Say what? Current is defined as the amount of charge divided by how much time has passed. Okay, technically it's the absolute value in that we don't want a negative current, but I'm just going to leave that off and I'm going to say it's a scalar. It's not really, but we'll pretend it is. If you have more charge passing by in a smaller amount of time, you've got a bigger current. Oh, not only that, we can also recall that any charge, Q, is actually a certain number of fundamental charges, electrons or protons. Q equals, well, if you know the charge and you divide by 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19, you'll know how many protons or electrons, depending whether your charge was negative or positive, you'll know how many protons or electrons you have. So we can actually relate current to the number of electrons that have moved through a circuit. Example 3. A 1.5 volt AA battery is rated at 0.75 amp hours. When connected to the motor in a portable CD player, oh, sorry, boys and girls, years ago, People used to store music on these circular, silver, shiny discs called CDs. And then we would wear a little player on a strap, and you could carry around your music in a box not much bigger than a CD. It seemed wondrous at the time. When connected to the motor in a portable CD player, 
the cell provides 0.25 amps of current. So first thing, A asks how much charge is stored in the cell. Well, the unit amp hour, isn't that amp current? Oh, I think I forgot to mention current is measured in amps. It's cool, coulombs per second. It's a scalar. So units, amps, named after a scientist whose last name was Ampere. So if they say that this battery is rated at 0 0.750 amp hours, they've actually given me a current time. Oh, if I rearrange this to multiply current times time, what's left by itself? If I rearrange this equation to multiply current times time, what's left by itself, Brett? Q. Turns out Q equals current times time. Which is going to be 0 0.750 amps what's the unit of time that they gave me? Seconds? Kara, what's the unit of time that they gave me? Seconds? What is the unit of time? That, please find the unit of time in the question and read it to me. It begins with an H. Louder, please. So ready? See anyone actually take you? What's the unit of time that they gave me, Kara? Hours. You know what? That's uh, 3,600 seconds. Yes? Do you know how many coulombs of charge is stored in this 1.5 volt AA battery? What is 0.75 times 3,600? Is it 2,700 coulombs? Yes, Brett? B. Brett, what does B want me to find? Okay, well, each electron is 1.6 times 10 to negative 19 coulombs, and I got 2,700 coulombs. Uh, the number of electrons is equal to the charge. N is going to be Q divided by E. If I go 2,700 divided by 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19. How many electrons are stored in an average AA battery? It's a fair number. What do you get? One point, so let's go 1.7 times 10 to the 22. Lots of electrons. Well, I'm not going to ask you be on a test. I'm doing this purely for the nerdiness of it. But a more interesting question is C. Katie, what does C want me to find? How long will this battery last? That's what most of you would be interested in, actually. Oh, how long can I power this device? Well, I know that current is charge over time, which means that time is going to be charge divided by current. How many coulombs of charge does this battery have from part A? Twenty-seven hundred. 
And the question says that the motor draws how many amps of current? How many amps of current does the motor draw? Careful, read the units. That, that's not that's not amps. That's amp hours. How many amps does the motor draw, Kara? Read. Huh? Hey, thank you. Okay, twenty-seven hundred over point two five. How many seconds will this last? Ten thousand nine hundred seconds. Ten thousand eight hundred seconds. Uh, divide by thirty six hundred. How many hours will it last? Emily, sorry. Even. Three even. Oh, okay. You get about three hours of play off this battery. There's other variables like the uh, temperature, ambient temperature, and, and, and things, but you get about three hours of play. Next page. Ah! Nothing. Sean, in our ski hill analogy, we said that voltage source is like a chairlift. Oh, and a resistor is like a ski hill going downhill. In our ski hill analogy, the flow of charges is sort of like the flow of skiers up and down the hill. Uh, problem. In real life, electrons move, not protons. But in our ski hill analogy, we kind of like the skiers to go up the chairlift and down the resistor. Since electrons flow at a constant speed in the circuit, we're going to assume that the skiers use their skis to control their speed and move down the hill at a constant speed. So we're going to pretend all the skiers go at the same rate. They're all holding hands or whatever. You know, it breaks down a little bit. But So no speeding up, no slowing down. But one problem we encounter with this analogy is in the circuit, it's the electrons that flow from the lower voltage through the to the higher voltage. But we'd like to say that current flows downhill. For this reason, we're going to pretend that positives are moving. When we look at a circuit, when we talk about the current, we actually say that current moves from positive to negative. Which sort of works. I guess, I guess Emily, if a bunch of electrons move to the left, isn't that the same as a net gain of protons moving to the right? Because you're more positive to the right if some negatives have gone away. So, example four says this. Draw the direction of electron flow. I'll do the electron flow in red. Electrons flow from negative to positive. However, we're not going to have our circuits go that way. Andrew, we want our circuits to go from positive to negative. So the conventional current, and I'll do that in blue, always goes from the positive battery through the resistor to the bottom of the battery. We call this conventional current. So you have electron flow. We have conventional current. And Joel, I'll use conventional current 99% of the time. In fact, I'll, st I'll drop the conventional. I'll just call it the current. Whenever we say current, we'll assume we're talking about starting on the positive end of the battery, going through the circuit, ending up at the bottom of the chairlift, ending up at the bottom of the battery. C. Ohm's law and resistance. Every circuit offers some resistance to the flow of charge. The circuit symbol for a resistor is a series of short angled lines, which it says you should recognize from science 10. I think you do this in science 9 now a little bit. If not, that's the symbol for resistor. The resistance is due to electric friction. 
where electrons collide with the atoms of the material that they are passing through. This causes them to lose energy. This energy lost by the electrons heats up the material they're passing through. Loss of energy implies a loss of voltage, a voltage drop across the device. If we go to our ski hill analogy, here you're at a higher altitude, you ski down a hill, now you're at a lower altitude. Here you're at a higher voltage, Trevor, you go down or through a resistor, at the other end of the resistor you're at a lower voltage. The amount of flow through the circuit depends on the total amount of resistance and on the voltage applied to the circuit. So let's use our imaginations a little bit here. It says this, example five. What can be said about the current flow in each case? If you have a high resistance, do you think more skiers can get through or fewer skiers can get through? If you have a high resistance, more skiers or fewer skiers? What would make sense? Fewer and skiers are current. High resistance, lower current. If you have a low resistance, large current or higher current. Which ski hills are more popular, the bunny hills or the really, really big ski hills? So if current is skiers, large voltage drop, more skiers. Hey, that's a popular ride. Small voltage drop, that's a bunny hill. Oh, I was going to write fewer skiers, that's no good. Small current. If you write it as an equation, it turns out it goes like this. V equals I times R. The voltage anywhere in a circuit is equal to the current at that location times the resistance at that location. This is called Ohm's Law. Named after a scientist whose last name was Ohm. We measure it resistance in ohms, by the way. I think I mentioned that up here, did I not? If not, we will in a second. Um, if we really want to be technical, Caitlin, we should write change in voltage for voltage drop, and ohm's law should really be change in voltage equals IR, but this notation is cumbersome. And so just like for T, we dropped the delta because we said time is always a change in. We're going to drop the delta voltage. It's always a change and it's always a before and an after. It's always between two locations. I'll never say to you, really, what's the voltage right there? I should always be saying to you, what's the voltage drop between two locations? Turn the page. Yes, Jacob, you too. Okay. The units for resistance are ohms. One ohm of resistance means that one voltage drop of one volt will give a current of one amp. The symbol for ohms, my physics teacher used to say it looks like a mouse hole in a wall. It's a Greek letter, omega. Really, it's supposed to look more like that. Well, like the type font. You'll find most of the time, mine looks like that, pretty sloppy. Greek letter omega for ohms. Good conductors have low resistance, wires. Poor conductors, called insulators, have large resistance. So example six says, mix and match typical resistances. I've given you one meter of metal copper, copper wire, one light bulb with very thin wire, electric motor, human skin, average lab resistor, and piece of glass. And then here are scrambled resistances. Let's see if we can mix and match these. Um, 
Let's start out. Which of these do you think is the best conductor and would have the smallest resistance? Copper wire, I agree. Where's the smallest resistance here? I think the copper wire would be 0.1 ohms. Nearly zero. Close enough that we're going to ignore it. I don't know how much you guys know about electricity. Which of these has the biggest resistance? Which of these is the best insulator? There's something better than skin. Glass, in fact, that's one of the common things that we use as an insulator. Which of these has the highest resistance then? Of those resistances to pick from, which one has the biggest resistance? Glass is a terrific conductor. In fact, the only way you can get shocked if something is insulated in glass is if the uh, thing arcs by uh, ionizing the air if a lightning bolt jumps. Did I say conductor? Oh, terrific insulator. Very good insulator. Sorry. Okay. Oh, let's cross off the ones as we write them out. What about a light bulb? Well, a light bulb, if the wire is very thin, the thinner the wire, the more resistance there is because you're trying to get electrons through a smaller diameter. Thick wire, less resistance. 200 ohms would be about what a light bulb has. The other way you can tell that a light bulb has a higher resistance, does a light bulb get hot? Yeah, it means a lot of the energy is getting transferred to heat. What about a little electric motor? Do those get very hot? Well, what gets hotter, a power drill or a light bulb when you touch the light bulb with your bare hands? Light bulb, so power drill has less resistance, turns out a good motor, electric motor, has about 5 ohms. Human skin is not a great conductor, which is why when you get shocked, it burns, because it doesn't let the electrons travel through very easily. They end up having to give up a lot of their heat to travel through them. What do you think the resistance of human skin is of the two that are left? Sorry, of the three, yeah, the two that are left. About 100,000 ohms. And a fairly typical lab resistor is about 2,200 ohms. You gonna make it, Nicole? Or was that Kayla with a big sigh? That was Kayla with a big sigh. Or was Nicole? Mm. Kayla, technically, by the way, the resistance changes with changes in temperature or the amount of current. Again, Mitsu, we're going to ignore that to make the math easier. Um, although human skin is a pretty good insulator, typically tens or hundreds of thousands of ohms, it will only protect us up to a certain point. When the voltage exceeds a certain value, the skin will break down. It will ionize just like air does to create lightning. And on the inside, we're basically salt or wa salty water, which conducts electricity pretty well. So how does death by electrocution occur? Well, there's two main dangers. Once the current gets beyond the skin, the danger to our health lies in two effects. Firstly, there is the heating up of tissue as electricity flows, because you have re internal resistance. Joel, this can cause severe burns and destroy internal tissues and organs. This is how an electric chair works depressingly, but this is how an electric chair works. Secondly, the flow of electricity through the body can disrupt the body's own electrical nerve impulses, leading to temporary freezing or paralysis of the muscle. This is why when someone is shocked, often they're frozen in place, because your nerves also work through electricity. The problem, Sean, is this. Two of your major muscles, the heart and the diaphragm, breathing and blood flow, um, don't require much current 
to have them fribulate or stop. So once beyond the skin, the heating effect grows larger with larger currents, but the muscle paralysis effect is most pronounced around a current of 100 milliamps. That's 100 times 10 to the negative 3. It's called the death current. Around 0.1 amps is fatal. The moral of the story is, Connor, be careful when you're dealing with electricity. Yep. Uh, your, your nerves do run through electrical impulses, and so when they shock you, what they're trying to do is send an electrical impulse to your nerves, and they're hoping that your heart will translate that message as start pumping again. And then they have, the, I mean, almost always, I mean, they don't show this in the fancy movies or whatever, but if you are getting shocked, you're almost certainly getting burns on your chest, but you're, it's a trade-off. I'd rather have to put some ointment and bandages on and be breathing. Um, if they're doing open heart surgery, they use a much smaller current because now they're applying the shock directly to the heart with these little small paddles, and they'll, they'll do that if they need to as well. Yeah, it's a neat technology. You guys have noticed now we have a couple of defibrillators here at the school, yeah? One in the hallway and the one in the gym. So, in our ski hill analogy, we said this. Voltage, it's like a ski lift if it's a battery, chair lift, or each resistor is a voltage drop. You're losing some altitude going through a resistor. It's like a ski hill. So resistors act like ski slopes that connect the top of the hill to the bottom. The amount of resistance, which is like electric friction, is sort of analogous to the depth of the snow. High resistance, lots of powder, you can't ski very fast. Smaller current. Low resistance, really slippery, you can ski fast. You can get more skiers through, lots of current. Basically, Ohm's law for ski hills says that the flow of skiers varies directly with the height of the mountain and inversely with the depth of the snow. Say what? It's easier to do. Example 7. Write this down. This is the main equation you're going to be using for most of this unit. It's on your formula sheet, but you will memorize it. V equals I times R. Ohm's law. Okay. It says, find the current in each case. How many volts high is the chairlift, Mitsu? So right here, I'm at six volts. How many ski hills are there? How many resistors are there? So how many volts must I lose going through this resistor? Let's label this resistor here with six volts. Do I know the actual resistance? How many ohms is the resistor? 25, and I know this. What do they want me to find in example 7, Mitsu? Okay, get the I by itself. I equals V over R, 6 divided by 25. You know what the current is in this circuit? Emily, what'd you get? 0.25. Enough to kill you. Not enough to burn you, but enough to cause your heart to palpitate. Uh, compare that. Here's our short circuit. Okay. Brett, how many volts high is our chairlift? We only have one resistor, and it's the wire. So how many volts must we lose going through the wire? We must lose six volts as well. What's the current here? Well, it would be... V over R, 6 divided by 0 0.001. How many amps are flowing through this circuit? Six thousand or six hundred? Six thousand amps? That would definitely burn you and probably kill you. Really? From a six volt battery? If you're not careful. I doubt you could get killed from a 6-volt battery, but you could certainly get burned from a 6-volt battery. So, this second diagram is an example of what's known as a 
short circuit. We call it short, it's slang, but we call it short because you're missing something. It's too short, you're missing a resistor. It will experience very large currents. This depends, of course, on the voltage source. For example, if you short circuit a AA battery using lab wires, you'll quickly deplete the cell because the current is flowing so fast. Remember we said each battery has only so much charge. It drains the charge very, very fast. If you short circuit a car battery using lab wires, has anybody accidentally short circuited a car battery? Mechanic students? Because that you can give yourself a nasty burn and a shock. The car battery has enough charge to make the wires very hot and possibly even melt them. If you short circuit an outlet with a lab wire, you'll create a dangerous current in your house wiring. So now we have circuit breakers or fuses. Those will blow, preventing a fire from occurring. That's why your breaker box, the old houses have fuses. The fuse actually would melt and you'd have to replace the fuse. Newer houses have a circuit breaker. A switch will snap, will click, and you have to go back and reset the switch. Great system. Otherwise, you'd have electrical fires all the time. The last thing. Can I make it, Connor? Sure. You will. We're going to talk about electric meters. Okay, so current and voltage are using ammeters for current and voltmeters, respectively. Ammeter measures current, voltmeter measures voltage, ohmmeter measures resistance. Consider the following circuit. So suppose I hook up a light bulb to a battery. As a drawing, Connor, I would do it this way. Source, resistor, and there's the wires. To properly measure the current, because the current is the number of skiers, the ammeter should be connected so that all of the skiers, all of the current, have to go through it. We actually need to break the circuit and insert the ammeter in series. We'll have more on this board in a later session. This would be correct because every skier would have to pass by this little gate and so you would know what the current was, you would know how many skiers. This would be wrong because some skiers would go through but some skiers could go this way, Andrew, and you wouldn't know how many skiers, you wouldn't know the current. This would be the wrong setup for an ammeter. You have to physically insert an ammeter into a circuit. I will be asking you on your test, I will give you a diagram with an ammeter or a voltmeter and I'll say which of these is inserted correctly. With a voltmeter, if I want to measure voltage drop, here I want to measure the height. The only way I can measure the height is to measure how high I am at one location, how high I am at another location, and then find the height drop between them. A voltmeter you actually install in parallel. You don't want to have all of the current going through the voltmeter because then you can't measure the height drop. So this is correct, this is incorrect. By the way, we have focused our introduction on direct current. Direct current DC always flows in the same direction, has a constant value. A lot of what I'm teaching you applies to alternating current, AC. Alternating current has a magnitude that varies as a sine function, which is why we don't look at it in physics 12, because I can't assume that all of you have taken math 12. But those of you that are in math 12 right now, sine goes up, sine goes down. Sine goes up, sine goes down. It, it's a trig function. It's alternating current. The alternating current power that BC Hydro delivers has a frequency of 60 hertz, a period of 1 over 60. And a voltage amplitude, math 12 students, can you hear the math words in there, the trig words in there, amplitude and period, of 110 volts. But we often use 120 volts to keep the math easy. It's actually 113.4 volts. Eh, 120. Homework. Take home quiz. Also, number one, number two. Number three. Number five. Six.
Nine. And the take-home quiz.